believe across North America, like Jennifer and Sharon, there's other folks who, you know, we've really become friends over the years working together in this field. So the opportunity to collaborate and get an opportunity here to discuss the potential collaboration and shares is really huge. So thank you again to all the faculty for traveling in. So the next speaker is um, Dr. Tara Setback, who's one of our own here at UBC <laughs> as well. Uh, but we're all training for UBC and she'll do the fellowship at Cedar sinai Medical Center in Women's uh, Cardiac Diseases. She currently is our director of the Leslie Family Women's Heart Health Clinic here at BGH. Um, she has special interest in uh, Minoka, especially microvascular coronary dysfunction and coronary basal spasm. We work very closely about scan patients as well. Um, she is the chair of the advocacy working group for the women's, Canadian Women's Heart Health Alliance. Thank Welcome, Tara. All right, thank you. Um, so thank you for asking me to speak. Um, so I'm talking about something a little different um, today, and we did a similar talk last year, but I'll certainly add to that talk with new literature that's come out in the last year. And really what we're looking at is the association between SCAD and some of these other disorders that we hear about, um, such as Takasubo, or stress-induced cardiomyopathy, coronary vasospasm, so really tight spasm of the arteries, and then microvascular dysfunction. Uh, I just have a few uh, disclosures, but none of them really pertain to the talk today. So, as many of you know, Takasubo cardiomyopathy has been talked about for a long time. And it really is derived from this Japanese word for octopus uh, pot. It really kind of looks like an octopus or a pot. Um, and really it comes from this sort of thought that there's an adrenaline or catecholamine excess and then the, the heart becomes stuck. And really, a lot of it is the apex of the heart, sometimes the anterior or anterior septum or anterior lateral walls of the heart become quite stunned and you end up with this sort of pot-like shape and then the basal sort of segments of the heart still contract. And so the Mayo Clinic has come out with a diagnostic criteria which most of us use, which is really sort of an acute transient abnormality in function of, of the ventricular wall beyond a single coronary territory. And sometimes that's difficult to differentiate. New ST segment changes on an ECG with the troponin MI, so really a, an acute coronary signal presentation, and then absence of another cause. So absence of coronary disease, in particular, they want to roll out field coronary cytoma and myocarditis. Now you can see here that there would definitely be some similarities between Takasubo and SCAD. So for instance, uh, SCAD and Takasubo are more common in women. In fact, in Takasubo, up to 90% of presentations or more are in women. It's exceedingly rare to see a male with a taxable presentation. They're um, often uh, presenting with acute coronary syndrome um, uh, type of presentation. They're often preceded by a stressor, and that tends to be more emotional, particularly with Takasubo, although it can be a physical stressor as well, and certainly with SCAD both. Uh, results in significant wall motion abnormalities. Uh, so Takasubo, that's part of the definition, but certainly with SCAD, you see that as well. And with both, Often you can see resolution within three months. So if you look at their wall motion abnormalities, you re, um, look at, of course, in SCAD, you re look at the dissected vessel, often a lot of it is resolved by three months. So there's sort of a quick turnaround time or can be uh, a quick resolution. So then what are the possible relationships between Takasubo and SCAD? I think a lot of us have heard about cases where, geez, maybe there's both going on, maybe there's one, but then it turned out to be the other. So I think there's three possibilities, and you'll, you'll see at the end which I think is the most common, but certainly I think three are plausible. So the first is that SCAD may be misdiagnosed as Takasubo. And often that will occur um, particularly with LAD or diagonal type of presentation for SCAD, where it's a long wraparound LAD or a large territory, and then it very much, you're not using your SCAD eyes and looking for SCAD. You just see a normal artery and lots of wall motion abnormalities and you diagnose it as Takasubo. But then when it's reviewed, again, with somebody looking more carefully for SCAD, you can often find SCAD. You know, there's been a thought that maybe SCAD is concurrent with Takasubo. And again, this is hypothesis generating. I don't think that it's definitive. But certainly, these are in cases where, for example, wall motion abnormality seems to be more than you would see with just, just a SCAD artery alone. Uh, there's rapid resolution of the wall motion abnormality, thinking more that Takasubo may be playing a role in addition to the SCAD. Or sometimes if you do do an MRI, you may have you know, lack of or minimal delayed enhancement on that, thinking that, geez, a lot of the wall motion abnormality was perhaps due to the stress of the situation causing it to Takasubo, but there's also a SCAD event occurring as well. 
And then finally, Takasubo um, may cause scatting. I put a question mark here because I think there's case reports, but I think this is not definitive as well. Um, and really, the thought is that there's vigorous contraction, as I showed you before. There's sort of that pot like shape, and then there's vigorous contraction um, of the basal septal uh, or um, the basal contractors, and that that vigorous contraction maybe leads to shear stress, and maybe you dissect the LAD from that. Again, you know, case reports, nobody's uh, had anything definitive. I think by far and away, number one is, is what we see the most commonly, and now we have a lot of different case, or case series. I'm, I'm presenting the two most common case series that have been presented in the literature, um, and the larger ones, but there's certainly a, a other case series out there. So uh, one is from Vancouver, uh, and Anne Chu and, and Jack Saw were the main authors on that, and then the other was from New York, and this was published actually just in abstract form a few months ago. We actually don't have a final paper yet, um, so I'm just presenting preliminary findings. But in, in Vancouver, there was 99 Takasubo patients, of those, they found um, when they went back and looked at the angiogram with scad eyes, they were able to see that about 8 or 8% 8 of them actually did have a missed scad event. Um, they added on one more that was from, from elsewhere, just into their series, and found that there were four presenting with ST elevation on their ECG, five with ST segment depression or, or no ST segment changes. Two of them had a significant emotional illness, two had a viral illness, and then there were varying um, uh, culprit arteries, but most commonly LAD or diagonal, and most commonly well notion abnormalities were sort of anterolateral, apical, or apical alone. And then the case series out of New York, uh, 84 Takasubo, uh, 6 or 7% um, SCAD, again, similar proportion of STEMI and non-STEMI, two were emotional triggers, so again, not a lot of emotional trigger. Uh, and then the culprit artery in all of these was felt to be the LAD, and all of them had um, apical or anterolateral apical well notion abnormality. So um, coronary vasospasm, which is a bit of a different entity, is, is uh, really represents probably only about 1% of acute coronary syndrome and about 2% of cardiac arrest, depends on what literature you look at. It's often associated with migraines, which is sort of vasospasm of the blood vessels in the brain, rain outs, which is vasospasm or, or, or spasm of the blood vessels in the hands, leading to color uh, discoloration and pain. And some of the triggers for vasospasm, uh, uh, cocaine, um, uh, epinephrine, stress, can be catheter induced, where you actually have the catheter in there and it can cause spasm hyperventilation. And the diagnosis is extremely difficult to make. Uh, you know, rarely, and I call a lot of these patients, rarely you'll see ST segment changes at the time of chest pain on a monitor, and you have it, or rarely you'll see spontaneous vasospasm during an angiogram. Uh, but uh, a lot of us do proceed on to do provocative testing in some cases to try and define whether or not they truly have it. And that's really where in the angiogram lab you instill either acetylcholine or ergonomine and try to bring on an episode. Um, so you can see that there would be similarities between vasospasm and SCAD. And so they both uh, often will present with acute coronary syndrome type of presentation, although um, uh, vasospasm can just present with chest pain or unstable angina. They uh, can be preceded by precipitin, so emotional or physical stress, um, uh, and uh, cocaine would be another one that would be common. Um, they can result in significant wall motion abnormality. So again, if you have spasm of the LAD, you could have a significant wall motion abnormality of, of the LAD. And seemingly normal coronaries, of course, going back and looking um, at the endogram, maybe you missed scat. Uh, but nonetheless, um, you can sometimes uh, just think that it's normal. So what's the relationship between vasospasm and SCAD? Well, as best as I can tell, there's really only two possibilities. And the first is that SCAD can be misdiagnosed as vasospasm, and again, it's because of those similar presenting characteristics. And the second is that it's possible, again, I don't think this has been proven definitively, but it's possible that vasospasm could be associated with the cause of SCAD. And again, this is only a few case reports. You know, there's some rare reports of people having a lot of chest pain preceding their SCAD and after their SCAD and that they then undergo this provocative testing, have a positive provocative test, so maybe they had vasospasm all along. Uh, there's case reports of known agents that cause vasospasm, such as 5 fu and convergently, which are chemotherapies, causing vasospasm and also resulting in SCAD. Again, it's case reports. But I think, again, the most likely thing is that SCAD is misdiagnosed as vasospasm. Um, this is just the one series that I just wanted to show you, 185 patients who had uh, a lot of ongoing sort of episodes of unstable chest pain or unstable angina, and they all um, underwent ergonomic testing just to see whether or not they had vasospasm, and 11 of those actually had prior scab. 
Uh, so they had prior SCAD, they had chest pain before and after their SCAD, and then they underwent ergodopine testing, and only one of those turned out to have vasospasm. So I don't think that there's a lot of patients out there that have both vasospasm and, and SCAD. I think it's more likely that they're misdiagnosed. So finally, uh, in the last five minutes, coronary microvascular dysfunction, which is really a cause of stable angina. So it really doesn't cause a lot of um, acute coronary syndrome, although it is in the differential, uh, but more likely to cause atypical chest pain or stable angina. It's really disordered of small blood vessels, so-called you know, um, coronary resistance vessels. And it has a functional definition, and that's sort of defined by invasive coronary reactivity testing, where we put a wire down into the small blood vessels, and we test their blood flow with an agent called adenosine, or some people use acetylcholine or other agents, to see if they improved their coronary vascular flow by more than 2.5-fold or more than 3-fold. And um, uh, the definition of microvascular disease is less than 2.5-fold, although in studies, a lot of people will look at less than 3 as well as, as finding a possible microvascular dysfunction. So um, in our SCAD series, which we have a lot of people now, um, uh, you can see that there is a lot of chest pain and a lot of symptoms post-SCAD. And in fact, out to, uh, to one year, two year, three years, up to five years, you can see 20 to 40 percent of SCAD patients have ongoing chest pain after their SCAD event. And in fact, we go back in, a lot of those are healed. So what is causing the ongoing uh, chest pain? And in fact, what we know is that the frequency of symptoms is actually pretty high. So 50% of, of patients will have still have symptoms five years out from their event, and a lot of that is chest pain and atypical chest pain, and 20% of those patients have symptoms at least three times a week, uh, and that's often chest pain, and more than five years out from their event. So what's causing that? I mean, their scab is healed, and they've not had a recurrent scab, because often they're searched for that. So we, uh, we undertook a study where we did coronary reactivity testing um, in uh, uh, patients who had a previous scab event to see whether or not microvascular disease may be accounting for some of their chest pain. We uh, looked at all 521 scab patients, 42 were eligible, a bunch um, uh, declined, didn't want another angiogram, weren't symptomatic enough, and we ended up um, uh, enrolling 18 patients. One of them actually had a chronic scab, uh, but the other 17 we could actually do this coronary reactivity testing in and look at coronary blood flow. And we actually did it down one scab or a previously affected scab or a heal and down one non-scatter artery. And what we found was that 76% uh, of them had an abnormal or sort of lower CFR less than three. 70.6% um, had a CFR less than 2.5, at least one artery, so so-called you know, um, microvascular disease. And of those, you know, FMD was again pretty common. It was pretty common in the data set anyways, but very common in these patients, about 76% on screening. And what we looked at was that in the SCAD artery versus the non-SCAD artery, what was the percentage of those patients having a low CFR or a high IMR, uh, which is more of a resistance measure and thought to be perhaps uh, coming out as one of the better tools to look at microvascular disease. And it turns out that the amount, the number of patients that had an abnormal CFR or IMR in their SCAD artery versus their non-SCAD artery was identical. So it's not just that they have, it, have abnormalities down their scab artery. In fact, a lot of patients have abnormalities down their non-scab artery. Never had a scab event down that artery, and this, that artery is very abnormal. And so or the microvasculature is very abnormal. And so the thought is that perhaps, you know, obviously if it's down the scab artery, perhaps there's some you know, uh, distal embolization that could lead to uh, CMD. But more than likely, it's actually the underlying vascular abnormalities that we've talked about, FMD being one of the most main ones, that could be a link between scab and ongoing chest pain, or uh, ongoing angina due to microvascular disease. So in conclusion, uh, just a few uh, sentences. So tachycephal cardiomyopathy and vasospasm can both mimic uh, SCAD, I think you really have to, so I get a lot of Minoka in my clinic, that's what we specialize in, Minoka and Inoka, and I'm constantly sending emails to Jackie and to Andrew saying, can you have a look at this? This is Minoka, they have a high troponin, they've been diagnosed with Minoka, but could this be a missed SCAD? And in fact, a lot of the time, it is a missed SCAD event when it was called taxidermal or it was called baby spasm. So just going back and re-looking at the angiogram pictures or doing some specialized testing like IBSR or CT uh, to make sure that it wasn't a SCAD event. And then vasculopathies, such as microvascular disease, may contribute to some of those ongoing chest pain that, um, that patients have. And we're certainly looking at enrolling more patients in our study and also looking at where their ACE inhibitors or statins, um, agents that are co commonly used in coronary disease patients, um, whether they can have a role in treating patients long-term who may have both SCAD and microvascular disease as well.